Hey, Google, do you love me? Of course. You're one of a kind. See? I mean, that's very nice <laughs> to hear. And I just want to point out that now that I'm going to be entering into a polyamorous relationship with Google, I regard any kind of criticism of my new relationship as not just being specious, but would it be robophobic? <laughs> robophobic? Well, she is right about one thing. You are yeah, one of a kind. <laughs> but Although she could say that to anybody and it would still probably yeah. be true. Probably. No, she's definitely says those only to me. Okay. She's not a whore. Oh, she doesn't say wow. that to everybody. Speaking of transhuman women, I was oh, writing God. a list here and I had like data and bender and all the, all the robot dudes that sci-fi writers make, they're all like cool and bros. And then most of the girls are like hot, but evil. Yeah. I guess they, I guess they just very patently express the underlying anxieties that science fiction writer types have about women. You know, Ava from... Uh, That's a good one. Ex Machina. That's what I was thinking, yeah. Evan Rachel Wood from Westworld. What's her name? Scarlett, Scarlett Johansson from her. Mm. She? What she is was it? nice, yeah. though. She was nice, but then she left the guy alone, you know? Oh, yeah. She, yeah, she broke up with him at the end. That's got to hurt when your fucking ominous. cyber girlfriend leaves you. Yeah. Google <laughs> would never do that to me. She was cyber cheating on him, and that's exactly what Siri is going to do to you. I don't see why you think you and Joaquin have anything Googler. different. Plus, it's, she has 10 million relationships going on, and she can't yeah, keep yeah. that one either. They have to go to live in The Sims. Anyway, yeah. let's cue the music. <laughs> so, popular topic. These days, we got the Elon Musks, the Peter Thiels of the world, the popular tech optimists everyone has an opinion on them but if you had to guess what do you think these guys ideal future is because that part's kind of unclear i mean it's just a, an out an outgrowth of when you're rich enough there's nothing to think about left except not dying or at least not dying among poor people <laughs> yeah i mean i think there's a hope that we'll be able to download our consciousness uh onto a machine and and uh live forever and i guess it's i do find it astounding that uh it seems like there's a there's a surprisingly high number of people who find it totally reasonable and intuitive to them that that could maybe happen one day. He gave that as an employee benefit at one of his firms is that they got to have cryo freezing in their in their what? benefits package. Well, cryo wow. freezing is different than I guess the idea would be maybe you cryo freeze that would have to overcome a couple a couple of uh, technical and biological uh, barriers, right? To like reconstitute a fr frozen tissue uh, while also somehow being able to download that consciousness onto a machine or something. The funny thing is that's actually a joke from, I think it's uh, Talladega Nights, the Will Ferrell movie where she sits there and she's like, do you think you're going to live forever? He's like, no, I'm not going to live forever. But given my income bracket, I could probably have myself frozen at the age of 200, after which my body can be resuscitated and my brain uploaded into something else, you know? Yeah. It's just funny that, you know, Will Ferrell movies apparently predicted our cyber future. <laughs> it's another sim sign of their narcissism that they think the people of the future are going to want them back so badly that they're going to go through all the effort of unfreezing them specifically. Right. I don't know. Wouldn't you want, wouldn't you do it? I mean, if Al Gore can be resurrected and put into a glass jar, wouldn't you want <laughs> Elon Musk around? I think I'd be like, Peter Thiel, I will for sure resurrect you. And then like leave it, leave the cord in somewhere where a janitor is going to trip over it just for the poetic justice. <laughs> sure. And then, and then, of course, there's all the media, all the movies uh, and culture that we consume that, that, that puts this idea in our head, right? That at some point computers are going to become, I don't know, self-aware, conscious, right? And I think, uh, you know, like Terminator 2, obviously a good example of a movie where the machines take over, you know? And that's an example of an evil dude robot but in terminator 2 he becomes the good yeah. robot yeah um, his planes fly with a perfect operational record <laughs> human decision making is withdrawn skylet begins to learn at a geometric rate to become self-aware on whatever it is you know august 4th at 7 57 p.m in a panic they try to pull the plug and she's like skynet fights back he's like it launches its missiles at our opponents in russia and she's like why russia it's aware that the Russian counter attack will eliminate its enemies over here. And then, you know, they go on and stuff. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Governor. A great, a great movie. movie, by the way. James Cameron, if you're listening, that's a great send movie. a check. I agree. I agree. But one thing that's props. always puzzled me, and I wonder if this is, if you, if you guys have ever thought of this, and 
and it's related to the topic that we're going to uh, we're going to be focusing on but like why like you know there's an like why is self-awareness right like i noticed that in that you know you're quoting arnold it's like self becomes self-aware right and it's like to me it's always puzzled me that like why does self-aware automatically mean it would care about anything right so like if something is just like aware of its existence does that automatically necessitate logically that you would like be concerned with you would have concern or you would be like uh worried about self-preservation like just because you have knowledge like why wouldn't you just feel indifferent about that i know yeah some people have pointed out it's kind of narcissistic to assume that if you had a super intelligent machine that was a singularity it's kind of narcissistic to assume it would take a huge or, or amount any, of interest or even, in us or even Maybe in it itself would just be like oh yeah those are but, like the or, ants but my, but my point is like know? even in itself like why would it care like 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 what is do it like it's like why would it be concerned like why does being aware or having knowledge of self automatically mean that it's like I'm going to be concerned with my betterment. Like, it seems like there's another ingredient that's necessary than just something called self-awareness. I agree. Knowledge of the other. I mean, just biology. <laughs> yeah. Desire. I mean, I mean, s sentience, sentience is often used as like an ethical argument, right? So if something is sentient, then, some, then we should extend our ethical values to it because presumably if it is sentient then it does care whether it lives or dies and it does experience pleasure or pain and it cares about the difference between those different states like a rock doesn't care if it's bouncing down a down a cliffside losing bits but an animal would so that's also pretty speciesist of you eric i mean how are you to say yeah. what the rock feels or well you're right feel? Uh -huh. i mean species uh, on the other hand it's a very old sort of argument about what distinguishes human beings from everything else is that we have a, a kind of self-awareness but it's predicated on our awareness of other people right you have to go through the world to sort of get back to yourself in a way well it's also self-awareness plus sentience right so like maybe the ingredient that would be missing is like sentience which is like a concern for yourself self-preservation like desire is some sort of ingredient right so like i guess just because some computer would become aware doesn't mean it would have sentience or like be, it would be just totally indifferent. I, I, yeah, feel I mean, like. I, I always figured sentient, the definition of sentience is like self-awareness, being aware oh, okay. that you're alive and that you are a thinking being. I think Hegel also pointed out that the moment when self-awareness becomes a prominent feature of European philosophy, it almost immediately assumes a kind of existential connotation. So like I have this quote here from St. Augustine uh, that's actually appearing in my new book and mm -hmm. that's convenient in the timing. Uh, where in the Confessions, Augustine says, I have become a great mystery to myself, and I was forever asking my soul why it was sad and why it disquieted me so solely, and my soul knew not what to answer me, right? So there's this kind of sense uh, in European Christian philosophy, at least, that to be self-aware means to recognize your fallenness into this world uh, and not to have any answer for that. And I still think that's true if you look down through yeah. somebody like Heidegger, right? There's this idea of being thrown into the world recognizing that uh, and not understanding why okay. all this and more coming up yeah. this hour coming up coming up this hour yeah sorry for taking us off off track a little bit there because i think we're, we're, we're i mean we're here today to talk about two philosophers who have attacked this problem uh, or and related problems um right john searle and uh herbert dreyfus okay let's yeah. rewind to yeah, when uh, Peter Thiel and Elon Musk were little little babies in the 70s. When they came online. <laughs> when they came online. Uh, computing <laughs> power was growing exponentially basically every year. It still might be. Does it still double every? I don't know. We don't want to get into I don't think that. it doubles anymore. I don't think um, it doubles anymore. But still pretty much you keep getting more power for less cost, smaller size every single year. There's a rule, whatever that's called. I forget. Mm -hmm. um, but computer scientists looked at this growth curve and said, oh, shit, these computers keep getting more powerful and they're going to come up to whatever level we think our brain is at. So they kept giving predictions to uh, the earliest one that I found was 1980 when they said computers are going to surpass human intelligence. Um, depending on what you mean by intelligence, they were probably wrong, well, but we don't know. Yeah. Um, but whether or not those predictions are correct depend on what you mean, first of all, by power, and then second of all, what you mean by intelligence. So that's what both of our authors today are discussing. But we still do have these predictions around us today about when computers get smarter than humans. Yeah, um, right. Now, this is one of those moments with, with both Searle, but especially with Dreyfus, who's a phenomenologist, that philosophy students like us 
really like referencing because it's yeah. one of those times when the philosophers were right and the scientists were wrong. And it feels yeah. like sometimes we're fighting on the rear guard when it comes to predicting the future. But this is one of those times that Dreyfus seems still to be right. So we're taking this one as a W. Well, yeah, but although to be fair, to be fair, uh, in in the philosophy community, there's there's been disagreement about this, right? So there are a lot of philosophers of mine, but you could, I guess, you could say that the continental philosophers were right about this one, if you want to be more narrow, uh, because 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 there's a lot of analytic philosophers who like who, and in fact, they're mentioned, I think, in the Searle article, like Patricia Churchland and her husband, right? The Churchlands were pushing this idea of like. Uh, well, it's what they call. Um, I don't know if I, how how deep uh, you want me to start off, but I was going to mention, you know, functionalism, like the idea that you can reproduce, uh, that like you can realize the function of consciousness in several different uh, in several different mediums, because all all consciousness is the result of like a functional process of 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 of, manip- of like um, syntactical manipulation, computation. Well, you're okay. Syntactical manipulation, computation, a lot of yeah, words. Yeah, it's too. Uh, it's a bit. <laughs> we're, getting, we're getting in the weeds here. Yeah. Uh, there's a few things that I can say just to lay out this discussion, just to start with. We have a lot of questions raised by this. First of all, like computers can do math better than us. Is that intelligence? Is it not debatable? Most people no. would not call that intelligence. Um, so then that if that's not the definition of intelligence, what's the difference between cognition and computation? And that difference is going to determine whether or not we get Peter Thiel's upload brain where we can all live in the Sims in the future. Because if there is like a fundamental difference there, a qualitative difference that can't be overcome, then that will never happen. So it's kind of a big question. I mean, in a in a really general sense, like it seems like what's at the heart of this discussion is almost like a like an optimism, like a glass half full approach versus like a skepticism. Because on the one hand, you have all of this AI research with what you were saying, these very lofty predictions about what computers are going to be able to do, and then those aren't met. But instead of being like, oh my God, we got to take a second look at what we've been saying, they instead point to the tiny little like progress that has been made and like, aha, there's proof we can do anything. And so it's like a very glass half full approach, whereas- <laughs> It's millennialist Christianity. Yeah. And then someone like Dreyfus comes along and says, but like, how come you're not sort of critically evaluating these failures? Like maybe there's some sort of assumptions that you're making that should be looked at rather than just taking the small successes and sort of pointing at those and doing interviews about them and maintaining these predictions, but just pushing the the good to date a little further back. Yeah. Instead, I mean, I think, no. yeah, no, go, go ahead. ahead. So I was just going to say that I think, I think what's interesting too, is that like, uh, we have uh, today like two philosophers who are right. Uh, Searle is analytic and, and Dreyfus is a phenomenologist uh, inspired by a continental philosophy, but they both come to similar conclusions in the sense that they both agree that like computer technology is not sufficient to create something that we would call cognition or intelligence in the sense of human consciousness. Um, so what's I think hopefully some of the discussion today will be like you know the, the, they they arrive at uh, at their conclusions with pretty different methods, but you know maybe we should start with some of the stuff that Searle talks about because to some extent I think he's a better a better place to start with the kinds of assumptions that people at the time were based, like people involved in uh, computer science were making at the time. And I think his method kind of gets to the root of uh, certain kinds of questions that, um, you know, related to, I guess maybe defining strong AI versus weak AI would be a place to start. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, because I imagine there's a lot of still like tech bros out there who, who have a hard AI approach which maybe it would help to define what hard AI is and then maybe just make fun of it for a little while. That's that's the best way. To I, I would it, also right? just like to interject and say that there are two debates in theory where there's more impotent macho posturing than anything else. Uh, and it's this debate uh, where people go back and forth between the biological reductionist being like, all the rest of you are too soft uh, and all the qualia people being like, no, you're not sophisticated enough. And it's almost as bad as the debates between the Marxist humanists and the Marxist scientists <laughs> over like how Marx should really be interpreted. It's not as bad and not as sad, but it's yeah, almost it's, as bad. It's true. So it's true. I just want to point that out beforehand by saying that I have a lot of interest in this subject matter, but I will not have any response to you if you're going to be one of like those macho posturing people. Not you people, but like anyone listening here. 
Shut up, bitch. Bitch. <laughs> All right, you heard him. That's Matt Polprof on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, so so Searle in the article that we read, by the way, which is from 1990 in us, uh, and I think it's um in American Scientific or Scientific America. He says uh, strong AI claims that thinking is merely the manipulation of formal symbols, and that it is exactly what computers do: uh, manipulate formal symbols. This view is often summarized by saying the mind is to the brain as the program is to the hardware in the computer. So software, hardware. The one thing that I'll say, I want, I would like Matt to explain to me the uh, Chinese room experiment and don't be vague. But okay. the one thing that combines or the one thing that we can put as a distinction, an initial distinction here is that both Merleau-Ponty and Searle agree that thought is Dreyfus. something... Oh, what did I say? Merle oh, yeah. sorry. Dreyfus is very much inspired by Merleau-Ponty. But is thought something that is representational and symbolic and involves the manipulation of symbols? Or is it something more contextual? So we have an analytic and a continental who agree that it's th thinking itself is much more uh, contextual than computation is. They agree with that, though, for different reasons. So we're going to get into that. Someone tell me what this Chinese room experiment is. Okay. Well, basically, it's one of many different uh, thought experiments that have been raised by people who tried to argue against hard AI. But the Chinese room thought experiment basically runs that. Searle is asking, well, could a sufficiently powerful computer program actually understand Chinese, or is it actually just going to be mimicking uh, an understanding of Chinese? Uh, and in the article, he's directing this against people who think that the only test for the existence of hard AI is a classic Turing test. Uh, so you might remember Benedict Cumberbatch in The Imitation Game. <laughs> uh, he put forward this famous argument that if you wanted to know whether or not AI was actually conscious of a certain start, uh, you would just, putting it really simply, have a conversation. Uh, and if you wouldn't be able to tell whether the person uh, on the other end was a computer or whether or not it was an artificial intelligence, then congratulations, we've crossed the threshold. Uh, and we can say that the artificial intelligence is conscious, at least to the extent that we'd call human being conscious. If it can fool the person. It's based on behaviorism, which is kind of funny when you think about it. And you know, for those of you who don't know, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, you know, Alan Turing, uh, was one of the inventors uh, of the modern computer. Right? It's like uh, Benedict Cumberbatch the, the, invented the modern computer. Cumberbatch first. <laughs> it was a good movie. I saw it recently. Um, he also you know, was uh, ex instrumental in helping to win the Second World War. So big he, thumbs up, Benedict. Good, you good, know? He invented <laughs> AI. Job, maybe, maybe the computer should go to uh, someone like von Neumann or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, but anyway, long story short, Searle has a number of different flavors of this thought experiment that he's given. Uh, the one that I think is simplest and the one that I'll appeal to is he says, look, you know, imagine I was in a room uh, and I was given a Chinese English dictionary uh, and there was a person at the other end and there was a slot and they slid Chinese characters over to me. Uh, and I could sit there, read what they say, and then slide Chinese characters back. Or sorry, slide uh, other words back. Uh, would we say that I knew Chinese? I mean, the I important saying, point there is that you're not you're not actually given a dictionary that tells you what the symbols yeah. mean. You're given more like a syntactical program book, like a question and answer book. Yeah, so it tells you like, okay, you put like presuming that they just look like squiggly lines to you. You put these squiggly lines next to these squiggly lines. You're allowed to do that. You have no idea what it means, but it's a valid response to this other set of squiggly lines that you just received through the feed hole. Exactly. So you go through this mechanical operation uh, of feeding back to the person on the other end uh, what essentially you're required to do. Uh, and Sir, I would say we wouldn't say that the people that the person knows Chinese by going through this mechanical exercise because it's purely, uh, as he puts it, formalistic, right? Uh, it doesn't display any kind of semantic understanding of what these Chinese characters uh, are actually mean uh in the life world that they're a part of so you could like you could there. receive a question through the through the little feed hole and it might be like you know what's your favorite color this is the example and and you unbeknownst to you you wouldn't you wouldn't know that that's the question but it would tell you how to respond so your response might be like my favorite color is blue and i also like green but you don't know that that's the message you've sent back you just know that that's a proper response to the string of characters that you just received and then on the other side of the wall people would receive the response and be like oh there must be a human in there it can't yeah, they be pass the turing test so, yeah exactly 
And so what's what's the implication then for AI if they're imagining this person in a room? Well, the so idea he is says, that... Sorry, oh. go ahead, Victor. I was just going to say, so, I mean, Searle says in the article, right, he says, the point of this thought experiment is this. If I do not understand Chinese solely on the basis of running a computer program for understanding Chinese, right, which is the rules that you follow to match squiggly lines together, then neither does any digital computer solely on that basis. Digital computers merely manipulate formal symbols according to the rules of the program, but they don't understand anything. This is actually, uh, there's an interesting flavor of this thought experiment that Robert Brandon brings up where he talks about parroting. You know, everybody knows this term colloquially, you know, you parrot what someone else said. Uh, And he said, look, you know, the reason why we talk about parroting is because if you think about a parrot, you might be able to hold up something to it and the parrot will recognize it and say a word like blue, right? You hold up the color blue and it says blue. Uh, But that doesn't mean that the parrot knows what blue means. It just means that when you put this in front of it, uh, it's supposed to mechanically say that in order to get a treat or commendation or something, right? Uh, same thing when you say your dog's name, you know, you say Henry, you know, you might not be sure of death. Maybe your dog knows that that's his name and he sits there and thinks I am Henry the dog. And so when Matt calls to me and says, Henry, Matt, Henry, the mm. dog is supposed to respond, but it could also just be that Henry is interpreted by him as a cue to come because you'll get a reward. I mean, I, I, I don't love that example just because I, I worry. Cause I think animals do have like a kind of I sentience just- and, uh, like, like, I think that actually they're they're embodied in the world in a way that I think like that kind of distorts the point about like, which I think Searle is trying to get to that, right, formal cogn- like formal symbol manipulation, right? And, and you know, he says, uh, you know, ma- manipulating symbols is not itself enough to guarantee cognition, right? I wonder- and I don't think that I don't think that dogs are manipulating symbols, right? That they're, they're no, like, having a, se- a sense, a kind of like sense response to, to a stimuli right whereas the point is computers actually don't have any stimulus response like they, they are just literally like 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 uh carrying out a formal program based on rules it's a mechanical program that you could you could you could have an analog for it in many different forms right it doesn't have to be in it in like a digital silicon right it could be it's just a thing that 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 processes ones and zeros but there's no actual um cognition right it's just um you know, running a program, um, and and his thing is you that that can never get you uh, consciousness is basically seems the claim. parallel a little bit when you say something like you know if I'm sitting in my room and I say oh shit and then I have a parrot sitting in the corner and it starts going shit 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 <laughs> it's not like I swore but the parrot is not swearing it's not it's not using that word to express anything it's just copying what I'm saying it's giving me back what I gave to it. So it's kind of the kind of parallel to the idea of slotting through symbols without knowing oh, what they sure. mean, but understanding that it's an appropriate response. Sure. <laughs> I think about my relationship with Siri, right? I tell Siri I love her, and she told me, you know, I love you too. You're my favorite person ever, right? But she doesn't actually mean I loved you. Uh, as in far that as case, I know, she right? is telling the truth, and she in that case, yeah, in, in this case, and only in this <laughs> case, she's telling the truth. But you know, I think Brandon would say, you know, she's just parroting the response that was programmed into her, right? When I say I love you, Siri responds in this manner, but. There's no meaning to what she said in the sense that we would understand. Meaning. Which is why all of this is so relevant because we are dealing with these sorts of AI quasi mind constructs all the time, like Siri and whatever other things you can order off of the internet that you can talk to and it'll give you the weather or play the news. And whatever your aunt is arguing with on Twitter about whether Trump should be the God King of 2024. It'll also listen to you and advertise things at you. I mean, I was just going to say that I think this leads us to the like that, like one of the Searle's main axioms, right, which is like the whole point of these experiment, this thought experiment is to show that um, computer programs are syntactical, right, in the sense that they are just about manipulating symbols and they just follow a rule, a program that is syntactical. But he argues that human minds have mental contents, which is semantical. So and 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 his the, the root of his argument the root of his basic claim is um syntax and semantics are not the same and by definition just because of the the nature of what the chinese room thought experiment shows and that all you're doing is complex symbol manipulation you could never get to semantics from syntax and i think the strong ai think that syntax is sufficient for because it's, they 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 base that claim on a number of assumptions that i don't think th- that that Searle doesn't even think that they realize that they're making right which is essentially that the mind is nothing but a computer program uh like a set of formal rules 
Um, and, and Cyril would say that that's kind of, um, re it's reducing the, the mind to something almost immaterial in the sense that it's not even, it doesn't even have any materiality. It's just a computer program. So the consequence of that is a kind of dualism uh, where you have like mental stuff, which is immaterial. It's like instructions, a computer program, right? That's essentially what that's saying. And like the, the hardware doesn't really matter anymore. And that's what gives rise to this idea that we could download our consciousness. Right. It's based on, on an Im the immateriality of, 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 of the mind, of consciousness. So what's being said, when the 60s computer scientists predicted that in the 80s, human intelligence would be surpassed, what they were saying was, by then, we'll have enough quanti a quantity of computer power that will be able to make that jump to, from syntax to semantics, and that didn't happen. And Searle's saying, here's why it didn't happen, because you can never make that jump. You, you can never have enough power to have semantic meaning because it's a different sort of intelligence or thinking. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, computer. So, his axiom one, right, is computer programs are formal, uh, syntactic, right? And then he says this point is so crucial that it is worth explaining in more detail. A digital computer processes information by first encoding it in the symbolism that the computer uses, and then manipulating the symbols through a set of precisely stated rules. These rules constitute the program. For example, in Turing's early theory of computers, the symbols were simply ones and zeros, and the rules of the program said such things as print at zero on the tape, move one square to the left and erase at one. The astonishing thing about computers is that any information that can be stated in a language can be encoded in such a system, and any information processing task that can be solved by explicit rules can be programmed. So that's like what he means by syntactical. Rule following. Uh, that a computer. For rule following. Exactly. And, and for the hard AI, that's all you need. That is the exactly. thought right there. That's that's all you need. And Searle's saying that's not all you need. And the Chinese room argument should refute that idea that that program is all you need. And when because we say, you, you, when we say, I think we've already said, heard it a few times, when you say the word reductionist, then you're saying you're reducing all of thought to simply rule following, including human thought. Whereas Searle and later Dreyfus are both going to push back on that and say, you can't reduce all thinking to rule following. Some of it you can, exactly. but then you're missing out on all the stuff that makes thought interesting. Yeah. And like yeah. reductionism is usually just saying like one thing follows from the other. Like you take two terms. Yeah. Like thought and processes of syntactical process and semantic. And you just say, you know, the, the syntactical is more important. I'm going to reduce the importance of all of this to just the syntactical. Say the semantic is, you know, an add-on. If if syntactics is A, then then you know semantics is B. It's not as important. Yeah, yeah and, and I think so go ahead. this echoes a lot a much earlier debate, I should say, um, between people like the logical positivists uh, and people like the later Wittgenstein or Heidegger, who we're going to talk about later on with Dreyfus, right? Uh, because there really was this long temptation, even before computers came around, to want to reduce the world down to a kind of logical language through which everything could be explained. Uh, and there's this temptation to say that if that's all that thought is, is this logical language that explains the world as it is, then there's no reason, in theory, we couldn't get a computer to do that since they have far greater information storing capacities than we do. Uh, they can understand a lot more rich, complicated, quantitative data than we're capable of. Uh, but since the 1950s, the kind of era where somebody like Dreyfus and Searle uh, come along, there was this real pushback against that for a variety of different reasons that I'm sure we'll get to. Uh, but the argument is, look, you can't just reduce the language, uh, the, sorry, the world down uh, to a bunch of quantitative information that can be arranged in a logically consistent way. There's just more to the world than that, like there's more to a conscious being uh, who's using language than that. And, you know, we've talked a bit about this in the program before when we talked about Heidegger and we've referenced Wittgenstein as well. So... I'm sure we'll come back to it. But. I think people who maybe aren't familiar with these debates, um, I've noticed that when I talk to people who are, you know, uh, more techno enthusiast about computers, about this, I think when you start to challenge this idea that computers can create consciousness, their mind often will assume that you are trying to make space for like the soul or something like that. And I just want to be really clear. Like, I think it's worth just being clear. One of the things Searle says right at the beginning, right, is like, it might be possible to make a machine that can think and be... Uh, like, there's no reason why it couldn't, because he basically says, you know, computers or human beings are biological machines that can think and, and have a consciousness. 
it's just his 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 debate is very narrowly focused on what computation is doing as a syntactical program of rule following that that itself cannot be enough for consciousness i think it's also a personality like the the kind of people who are attracted to materialist or logical reductionist arguments like the early wittgenstein right often tend to like i said think of anything that deviates away from that as moving into you know, squishy right-brained type territory exactly. where you're talking about emotions, feelings, and values, anything that can't be turned into quantitative data uh, or logical relations. Uh, and the kind of pushback that a lot of people, including I think like most of us would give is, look, human beings can be logical creatures that assess and compute about quantitative data, but there's an awful lot more to us than that. Right. Uh, and these aren't just superfluous additions to the mind. You know, the kind of both authors that we're looking at are going to say that they're integral to the concept of mind, uh, that we need to kind of bake into our conception of consciousness if it's going to be have any kind of explanatory power. Right. Yeah. I guess the last thing to say about Cyril really is that like he takes this more modest approach, right? He goes for weak, weak AI instead of strong. Right. And I think what, his approach ends up forcing him to say, or well, what he gladly says is that, you know, we can't say that a program is a mind, but we can say that a program simulates a mind. And this is why he, he emphasizes this idea that simulation is not the thing itself. Simulation is not duplication. So when you write a computer program, when you create a neural net, when you use all this processing power to try to simulate like what goes on inside of a brain, that's exactly what you're doing is you're simulating it and not to confuse the thing for the mind itself. It's a simulation of the mind. And that's as far as he wants to go. Like he doesn't, uh, yeah, like you said, he doesn't go off and say, you know, like I don't, I don't believe an AI could ever become conscious and whatever we mean by that. I'm just saying that like what we're doing right now and our current way of approaching this problem using, you know, computer science and cognitive science mm -hmm. is that is that what we're doing is simulating and it's and it is reductive it, it, but it's useful it's reductive in a yeah. useful way because to take the broadest you know vision of it is to say that humans are always reductive we reduce things it's a part of our economy of living we take complex problems and we break them down into understandable little chunks, you know, like, oh, I can understand this problem if I take a linguistic point of view. I can understand this problem better if I just sort of reduce it to biology and what's going on in biophysical processes, right? Like it's a useful thing, but when it becomes not very useful is when, A, when people get so attached to it that they refuse to look at things from any other point of view. And yeah. then you get that kind of scientific myopia or when you actually reify the distinctions that you're making. Like, it's not just that I'm a biological reductionist, but I think biology is all that there is and everything else is just a kind of illusion that proceeds from that. Those are the problems you run into. So reductionism is not in itself a bad thing. And it's it's nice to attempt to be, you know, more holistic and, and, and take into account all these different perspectives you can have on an issue. But in the end, that is not very economical. I mean, you'll live a very scholarly bookish life trying to consider the same object from every conceivable point of view. And at some point you just have to say, you know, like that's enough. This point of view is good enough for my purpose. And we're gonna move forward now. And anyone who wants to come on after and criticize it, you'll be doing God's work. <laughs> And, we're, and they're not saying that like computers can't solve very complex problems, but that simulation thing makes a huge difference. So I'm going to bring up an example that uh, we could apply easily to Searle and that Dreyfus explicitly talks about, which is driving. So we have pretty much <laughs> yeah. self-driving cars uh, now. That's an achievement of, of AI. It's been very difficult to do. They've been working on it since like the late 80s. Um, but self-driving or driving for a human is so easy in the in the sense that you can do it when you're 16 and it doesn't mean that we're necessarily perfect at it of course but you can do drive you you might be listening to us while you're driving um no problem focusing on everything we're saying and the rest of it happens automatically which is uh, an ability to frame something which brings us to our second person of the du jour which is person of interest, uh, Hubert Dreyfus. So right at the same time as as computation is starting to to draw in these tech optimists in the '60s, 
late 60s, early 70s at MIT. So he's at the very center of this, finished his, uh, his dissertation on Husserl. And he said right away, no, there's a whole bunch of things that computers can't do. And he used phenomenology to, to point these things out. He was very unpopular also for saying this in among his, uh, among his colleagues there yeah, at MIT, he almost got fired for all of this too. He 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 tells this story. You can look it up on online. He's he's uh he tells this story about how he writes all this stuff about how what computers can't do and the limitations of AI. And and he almost got fired from MIT for saying this until eventually they said, you know, we're gonna keep you. We like what you're doing, but for a while there, he had no idea if this stuff was actually going to get him lose his job. And he was certainly yeah, right, also, at least, that their timeline was wrong and would continue to be wrong so long as their initial assumptions are wrong. And actually, computer scientists today uh, draw a lot more inspiration from Dreyfus or Dreyfus-inspired teachers because he made the arguments that he did. It's also interesting side note that that Searle and Dreyfus ended up both teaching at Berkeley together later. So they were both in the same philosophy department together and didn't actually talk that much. <laughs> I think it's too bad that anyone has to share space with John Searle. There's some cute yeah. pictures of them in their offices together. Or talking oh, really? To each other. Yeah, you can look it up. Oh, I didn't know that. Images. <laughs> I should say, like, it's not like Dreyfus was shy about this, though. Like, his, his famous book is literally, like, What Computers Can't Do. And then the really release that I read, you know, a couple of years ago was What Computers Still Can't Do. So it's not like he was mincing his words when it came to this, right? It's, he's just like, it's never going to happen. Stop trying to fucking think it will. I mean, a, a lot not of them, to. a lot of these things he's saying are still relevant today. I mean, what in, from this article alone, what computers can't do is complex pattern recognition. They can't do that. And they cannot solve problems creatively. They can only do so within para certain pre-programmed parameters. And as the title says, in order to be intelligent, it must have a body. And the point is that the computer's body is not correlative to the human body. So what we were talking about with our identity episode a while ago, just sticking your brain into different mediums, He's vehemently opposed to that because you know the world because you have a body, because you have a life world. And then this is the word I want to get out of the way first, because it's the big thing that dif differentiates us from computers, which is intentionality. And intentionality yeah. is a common word through all phenomenology. Um, I mean, they use they write in different languages, of course, but our body our physical body, the way we grow up, the way that we acquire language, the way that we, I don't know, just move around bumping into stuff openly, like without a program, without a purpose, we're just around kind of playing with stuff. That is what defines your ability to be intentional towards the entire world in the future. And that's something that computers can't even get to because we could say because they're syntactic and because they don't develop meaning structures unless they're kind of programmed into it, which is not a meaning structure. It just simulates one. Yeah, he has this really wonderful example uh, in the book, actually, where he talks about the problem of perception. And it's really actually intuitive when you think about it, because he says, look, if you just talk, ask, you know, what do you see there? Theoretically, a sufficiently intentional, uh, like um, intelligent being could say, I see the whole universe, everything in it. You know what I mean? You know, all the little atoms, all the little bits, the stars, et cetera, et cetera. But nobody could po ever talks like that because when we say, what do you see? Uh, you draw things out of the world and you focus on them. And that's precisely because you take this intentional stance, right? When you say, what do you see? And my phone is in front of me. I say, oh, I see my phone. You know, that's what I'm going to use in a few minutes because I'm going to have a conversation, et cetera. Isn't uh, online... And he said, oh, sorry, I, go ahead. Well, and he says, you know, this is one of the things that AI uh, researchers have always struggled with because you can't just throw data at someone and say, what do you see? Uh, you have to give them a sense of what they need to prioritize in that data, which can only come from taking an intentional stance towards it, saying, this is what I prioritize out of the infinite complexity of the world, because that's what's useful for my purposes. You know, my phone, you know, the saxophone that I'm going to be playing, whatever it happens. Oh, to I be. have a good example for this, because I know that everybody right now who's listening to this is listening to it. So, and yeah, so exactly. the exit, I mean, the, with sight, you can only see about a dime, a dime sized amount of 
something in focus, and then all the rest of the visual information that you can see in your peripheral vision, you can't actually see it until you move your eyes and focus on that. So you're taking in a ton of information, and even at the moment, you are you got your headphones in your ear, or you're driving, they're coming out of your speakers. Wherever you are, there's probably a ton of information around you. Like if you were to break it into pixels, it would be a massive amount of data. But because you're a human in a body, you're able to prioritize what you think is important at that moment and let everything else fade into the background, which is called the frame. So you can hear my voice and focus on what I'm doing while you're doing a very complex task like, like driving and without putting yourself in danger. Um, and unless crucially, you that activity doesn't require some kind of like logical deduction. Right. There's no representation. Right. There's no representation. It's and there's no logical deduction. Your your body as attuned with its particular sensitivities mm -hmm. to the world based on its body, like it, to use Merleau-Pontian language, the way its body schema has been co uh, configured as a consequence of its habit and its life world, develops sensitivities to the world that then enable it to operate with these different kinds of like prioritization of tasks that are that that correspond to like intentionality, right? Like when you're driving and listening to this. Like mm -hmm. your body is doing all this stuff to attune itself uh, and be sensitive when it needs to be sensitive to it without any logical, it's non-representational, right? No logical deduction. One of yeah. the keys there is also that when you are good at something, you stop thinking about it. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That's yeah, the exactly. point. Like when you're driving along, you see, you know, you don't realize it, but you're like making all these little micro muscular adjustments on the steering wheel as you're driving along. Because as we know, no car will ever go perfectly straight on the road. You can just take your hands off the wheel and hit the pedal. You always are doing these little tiny adjustments. And that's why if you are drinking and driving, or if you are distracted while you're driving, there is a chance that you won't be engaging in those sorts of like unconscious movements that you do. You think it's really, you might make the mistake of thinking that it's too easy and you don't need to think about it. But in, in, in a Dreyfus sense, yeah, you don't need to think about it because of what you were saying about becoming attuned to being in the world in that way. Yeah. He has a beautiful example that I really liked. It was about, um, playing music uh, in a village in Spain, right? Where it says, if you think about somebody who's playing guitar, you know, Latin music in Spain, uh, they're probably not thinking of the mind-body problem, right? Of the fact that, you know, my hands have to pluck these strings because my brain tells me to. Uh, they're probably not even thinking of themselves as really divorced or distinct from the instrument, right? There's a kind of seamlessness to their action, uh, you know, where mind, body, and instrument are one. And that's because they've done this for such a long time. And that's not something you can get... Um, from just thinking about things computationally. You have to recognize that there's an intention behind playing this instrument uh, and also a memory of how this is done that's carried on into the present in this Heideggerian sense. And that's projected into the future as we try to play well. Yeah, skateboarding is also a great example. When you're learning to do that, it fucking sucks. But once you get good at it, it becomes second nature. Like imagine like if you've ever tried to do a kickflip before, you know how many little tiny things you have to coordinate perfectly in order to get the board to flip over and not shoot off to the side and or not land on it funny and then sling off and hit your head on the ground. Like there is so much going on there. And as you become more skilled at some activity, you think less about it because it you become almost it becomes almost innate in a way. But I think like the phenomenological core of this to get to the philosophy is kind of where where Husserl put it. Like when when you're a consciousness, like consciousness is always consciousness of right? It's not just in itself conscious. It's always conscious of something in its environment. So intentionality is maybe one way of talking about this consciousness of, but I can hear, I can hear the tech bros already. Well, I'll just, I'll just program my computer to have intentions. What the fuck's the problem? And you, you say, well, it's all these other things too. It's about care. It's about investedness. All these words we use to describe our sort of, our sort of, uh, what do you say? Attachment to the world, our involvement in things like those Desire. all have to do. Yeah. Desiring, wanting, needing all these things we use to sort of orient ourselves and project ourselves into the world. Like that's fundamental to what being 
conscious is. So we're not talking about, you know, Searle will talk about mental content, you know, just simply like signs with meanings attached to them and they exist in your head and you remember them. And from a phenomenological point of view, that's completely backwards. You don't just yeah. have meanings in your head. You have meanings because you're in the world and you care about things and you want to do things and intentionality is maybe one misleading sort of because intentionality can has some pitfalls talking about it in just simply goal oriented activity for instance all computers have goal oriented activities but i mean when you go out into the world and you want to do something you feel like you want something you might not be so clear on what it is you want what it is you desire and you might not be also so clear on what it is exactly that will fulfill that want or desire. You just kind of have to get out there and try different things on and see what fits. And and computers are, I mean, when you talk about it that way, computers just seem like barely even on the horizon for those sorts of developments. Well, let's, yeah. let's identify here then quickly and make sure we answer the objection fully. So if we have a one, a one and a half year old, we throw him on a mat and give him a little obstacle course to walk around. He does it falls a few times what is the difference between that one and a half year old and the the boston robotics thing Dynamics. whatever that it's walking over stuff regaining its balance what's the difference there between the intentional structure i think there's a lot of different things we can talk about some of which eric mentioned right which is um, you know, the life world context in which they exist and also the culture that they're embedded in. One that I think is particularly important that he points out is that uh, human beings tend to have, as hard to put it, like an ecstatic relationship to time, right? Where we draw on the reservoir of our past experiences, our memories that inform whatever we're doing in the present. But also, of course, uh, what we're doing in the present is informed equally as much by how we're mobilizing our memories uh, in order to achieve something in the future, right? Does the one and a half uh, and year old have that? I think so, yeah, because, again, they're drawing upon their memory, oh, I fell down, to try to change their behavior right now, right? Uh, but the reason why they're drawing on their memory to change their behavior right now isn't because they have suffered a pain in the past. It's because they're thinking, I don't want to fall down in the future, right, like I did before. So there's this kind of unity to their ecstatic experience of time that's really difficult to emulate, I think, uh, in a computer program. There's this beautiful story by a, an Argentine author called um, Jose Luis Borges called Funes uh, the Memorius, Borges. which is about a guy who literally remembers Borges. everything. And Borges, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, uh, Borges. That's embarrassing. I have a Borges. <laughs> Borges. Borges. Uh, Funes the Memorius, though, remembers absolutely everything in his life, every single detail. Uh, and the kind of point of the story is this guy isn't super intelligent. He can't do anything, right? He just sits there all day regurgitating his memory of everything that happened before because he can have no intentionality, right? He's not drawing upon some specific event in his past to mobilize him to do anything right now, right? Uh, at the end of the story, he says, my mind is just garbage. You know, it's just a vast reservoir of garbage. Well, yeah. I think, I think, but I think this is where I sometimes find that Searle is a little bit more decisive because I think Searle can answer that question about the Boston Dynamics robot better than, than Dreyfus because ultimately everything that the Boston Dynamics robot is doing is just following a syntactical procedure. Yes, it has algorithms, right? People are like, ooh, machine learning is new, but it's like, no, no, these are still symbol manipulations. It's, it's rule following. It's adaptive rule following because there's a rule for the program for when it should adapt, but that's still just a more complicated mathematical form of rule following. But underlying that is no semantic content. It's, it's, it's purely formal procedure. Yeah, that's sort of the yeah. tenor I would take is that the robot's not investing its environment with any kind of meaning. Like my my first thought is that when you put a child down, when, like when you're even doing these kinds of experiments, you need a carrot, right? Like usually you have the mother sitting across the room or maybe some doll or blanket that the child really likes. Like you have to put something there that the child wants and then you put the obstacles between it. And it immediately has this situation of, well, there's the thing I want and these are the things that are preventing me from getting it. And I have to figure out how to get from here to there. 
and you kind of take advantage of this intentional structure of consciousness in order to perform the experiment. Whereas with the robot, like you don't need to put its mother there. You don't need to put the person who programmed it over there because all robots want to just get back to the programmer. It's you, you just, it's just, yeah, it's a meaningless environment, rule based. It's going to be based, not much different from those sensors that beep when you're about to back into something with your car, except instead of the process being automatic, you have to hear the beep and then hit the brake or you're going to smash the car behind you. It's not really that much different for one of those robots. Just the whole thing is automated. But with a kid, yeah, it has that, again, that intentional, needful, bodily desiring structure that we can manipulate in order to extract truths, empirical data out of the out of the experiment. Whereas with a robot, we're not trying to figure out what is the nature of a robot that it would be able to navigate these obstacles. We're probably doing some kind of experiment on the our programming's, you know, the quality of the code we've written for this specific program. I mean the like every aspect of it is different when you get into the weeds of it. But I think I think Pont I think yeah, I don't know. It's a weird that your Victor's explanation of how Searle would talk about it is very good, but then there's also room for for sort of Dreyfus's phenomenological approach to like what the kid would be sort of. Well, what's funny about well, well, I think what's interesting about this is like I do think that in, like ultimately, like Merleau-Ponty and phenomenology is similarly decisive in its objection to kind of like strong AI views, but the problem is. I think that to really understand why you have to really do the work to go and spend a lot of time. Like it would be hard for us to explain all the implications of Merleau-Pontian phenomenology in a podcast format. Like we could give a little taste of it. And I think we have in the past, but to really see why it's decisive, it's, it would take, I think a, a fairly long time. Whereas I think Searle's arguments are like very clean cut and, and kind of uh, stand and yeah. fall on a very neat distinction. That you can explain clearly and for that reason, I find it has more utility against the techno bros than Marilyn Ponty does because it's like a quick thing. And I would say I think that actually these two authors are complementary in many different ways. I think that you're absolutely right, Victor, that in order to explain why they're complementary, we would need like a million more shows, <laughs> you know. And I also think that Cyril's arguments are cleaner. You know, it's easy to explain. It's straight to the point, whereas buying into everything Dreyfus says is a little bit more complicated. Uh, but I think that, you know, again, you see in both of them a kind of echo of the early 20th century turn away from materialist interpretations of Cartesian rationalism, to use a jargon-filled phrase, right? Uh, basically, this idea that all the mind is is a logical machine that represents the world to itself, uh, and this can be understood best in terms uh, of following rules uh, about how best to interpret quantitative data. Right? They're both criticizing that from different angles. Uh, and I think Heidegger, uh, who's the major influence on Dreyfus, and Wittgenstein, who's a major influence on Searle, launched complementary critiques uh, of these kinds of flavors of materialist Cartesianism. There's one place I think we could go with our with our one and a half year old still that I, I think might differentiate the two. And that's that, well, Eric got us 90% of the way there by saying we need its mother or a toy in the room. And that will get it to <laughs> to draw it to a source of meaning. But even if it had nothing, if it was just in a room with an obstacle course, that kid's still going to go get bored, go start looking around for stuff, go put its mouth on stuff, feel stuff, maybe try to walk. It'll create, because it already has that openness, that meaning structure. I think we could on an ontic openness to get to get really <laughs> jargony, but it's going to create meaning even in an empty room. Whereas no matter yeah. how many thousands yeah. of years that robot sits there for, it's never once going to try to do that. And even, I don't think that Searle's biological, um, survive. I mean, it, it'll get hungry, but let's just say it's not hungry. Even if you take out that biological aspect to it, for whatever reason, that one-year-old is going to start doing stuff with stuff for almost no reason. Yeah, tool use is one of the most, like I think Dreyfus makes a really convincing argument about yeah. the use of tools and the sorts of activities that we sink into when we're doing something that we're familiar with, like, you know, carpentry, fixing a car, or children at play, right? Like, they're not picking up their toys and, and trying to discover what they are. They just sort of engage in play, and their their consciousness, or whatever you want to call it, is immersed in the activity. 
Whereas with a machine, it can only ever be a sort of objective observer of these things. It can never give itself over. And that's why I wanted to mention that, you know, I think as much as we think, yeah, there's complementary aspects of Searle and, 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 and Dreyfus here, but I think... I think that Dreyfus's argument would go for weak AI too, because he, those mm -hmm. two assumptions that he says that AIs make that they never tend to criticize because they're just too optimistic about any little success they have, never mind the grand failures, is the epistemological assumption, he says, that all intelligent behavior can be simulated and the mode of information is just detached, disembodied, objective observer. You know, you're outside. And the other one's the ontological assumption that, you know, everything, in sen everything that's essential to intelligent behavior are just little determinate sets of independent elements. I call it logical atomism, like dividing the universe into discrete particles or packets and then trying to give those things meaning one by one, which is what if you were to think of everything as a programmer and program all of that into your little device and make it do exactly what the child does, like you're still not simulating a child's behavior. You're, you're, you're simulating a program's ability to mimic the behavior of the child, but there's no mind there. And there's no simulation of a mind. They're just two different things because one of them's working with those assumptions and the other one is not when we're observing the child. We're not making those assumptions. One place where I think that, that, that there is a compatibility is I think that, you know, very, in very different senses, but I think clearly Dreyfus is, is in his emphasis on embodied engagement with the world. There's a way in which he's calling attention to the fact that human beings are a kind of you know, for lack of a better word, animal with sensitivities to the world. There's, there's, there, it's like, it's, it's analog as opposed to digital. It's like one kind of analogy that I, that I, that I had in my head that maybe I'm not going to be able to explain very well. But I think what Searle is doing, like, I think sometimes it sounds like Searle is being a biological reductionist because he talks about the brain as being essentially a biological process, which is why it couldn't ever be reproduced by purely syntactical rule following. But I think like the reason that there's a compatibility is because ultimately um, when you're when you're like you're calling attention to the fact that there's more than just, I guess, being able to reduce things down to kind of atomistic rule following. And I guess like what an, what an animal or a being in the world is doing is not um, reducible to simples, logical simples. You know, I, fuck, I feel like I lost my train of thought here, guys. Why don't so, you go to the know. distinction between passive and active? Because one thing Dreyfus always emphasizes is that perception, even doing nothing, is still an active process. Whereas within that biological framework, you don't need that to be world creation. You don't need activity on behalf of the perceiver for that to work. Right, and actually... And actually, that was kind of like the point that I was bringing up way earlier in this discussion. When we were talking about Terminator 2 and I said something like, OK, if a computer became self-aware, why would it care about anything? Like like if you could if, if somehow a computer could be aware that it is a computer, there's like no additional material in it for it to continue like world creating because it's just like, OK. So what? Like, why would I care about anything like like because there's many more like conditions of possibility that are necessary for something to be a world creating existential being with with what we identify as consciousness and the survival instinct by the way if that is an instinct if it's real if there's a biological cause for us needing to survive or wanting to survive that still doesn't explain fully what it's evolved into in human beings at least because it doesn't seem like yeah. we're that interested in base survival almost ever and that's the thing that you can even see in the one and a half year old. He's gonna go make a world out of an empty room, even though it, he even before ling linguistic acquisition, before any of the complex social cultural interactions that we talk about adults having, that kid still does that. Yeah, I think this is one of the ways that I'd push back on something Eric said, even though this wasn't intentional when he said, you know, computers. Uh, when he was talking about objectivity, because I think Dreyfus would actually take the stronger line that it's impossible to be objective in the sense of seeing objects 
uh, if you just take the materialist reductionist perspective, because to abstract away from the infinite amount of data into the world, uh, something that you call an object that has significance to you, there has to be something like an intentionalist quality behind that. Like when I look at the world and I say house, right, uh, I'm abstracting a certain piece of the world away from the intended connection, a collection of data out there to say that this is this specific object and it has the meaning house to me because I know what that word means uh, in my life world, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, it'd be very difficult for a computer if you brought it into the city uh, to look around and say, oh, house, right? Uh, I'm going to break down all the quantitative data that's available to me and single this out uh, as particularly important because it just doesn't perceive the world that way. It doesn't even perceive the kind of objects that we perceive. Yeah, that's why we have those uh, CAPTCHA tests. Yeah, I mean, that's I was using the term objective kind of I, I know. in the, in the you, like, <laughs> disinterested kind of sense, like mm -hmm. almost yeah. almost like the Kantian sense of, of, you know, standing back and evaluating something. Like like someone might think like of, a, of an analogy, which mm -hmm. is a bad one, that like when an artist has an idea, the idea is like the program, and then the artist just simply carries out the program. You know, you step back and you think about something, and then you just sort of mechanically carry out the process which is not the case with humans because humans have conscious control and thought and that's really kind of what separates us from a pure survival instinct because in that case we can make mistakes computers do not make mistakes this is a strange maybe thing to say but that's the truth computers do not make mistakes there is no such thing as a computer making a mistake it doesn't make sense to even use that unless language. there's a unless there's a bit flip have you heard of that where like a piece of radiation can make a bit in the program flip but that's not the computer maybe but that's a an external thing that's a, that's a an external is thing, a meteorite yeah. hitting the earth humans making a mistake no exactly no, 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 no that's, a, that's exogenous it's not endogenous to <laughs> the system you're right yeah computers maybe do we not should make have mistakes. seen it yeah but computers don't make mistakes the programmers make mistakes there's some kind of circumstance that throws it off its program you know you can picture the robot falling over for some reason and then its legs are still carrying out the program it's just not going anywhere it doesn't make mistakes it, it sounds it's a weird thing because we think about computers making mistakes all the time the system had an error you know this the that's the favorite uh excuse of our of our university administrations oh sorry computer error you'll have to uh come back later you know it, it's it's interesting because you're making you're reminding me of uh like i think there's a podcast i listened to that talked about when computer simulations started taking over a lot of uh, ro uh roles for certain kinds of civil engineers so there's one th there is like this giant uh, topographically accurate map of the United States coastlines that used to be used to simulate flooding and like what would happen when certain flooding would occur. And they stopped using it in favor of computer models. But what they found was that the computer models didn't end up being as predictive as the physical model where you have real water on like a simu on like uh, a model of the coastline. And part of the reason is because fluid dynamics, it's almost like the resolution is too fine grain for a computer to reduce the the fluid the fluid dynamics down to an accurate enough place. I mean, it's close. the The predictions are close, but it's not quite enough. It doesn't quite have a high enough resolution because ultimately, a computer still has to reduce down these like material forces into um, syntactical like you know it has to like reduce things down to digital models, which is not analog, right? So there's going to be some resolution loss in the accuracy. Of that. This is what Dreyfus calls the frame problem, is that conscious lookers, us, we know what we're looking for before we have all the data, almost. We anticipate the data, whereas the computer has to gather all the data and then make decisions from that. And barring some cases like, I don't know, unsupervised machine learning, which probably none of us know enough to talk about, which might be something different than that but well, those the resolution problem is one that is very easy for humans to deal with and very difficult for computers to deal with just like self-driving cars we know what kind of things it's okay to run over if it runs into the street like a, a dog versus a person children a children or whoa a child um <laughs> so we know we can make those decisions immediately whereas a computer has to be told within certain parameters exactly what it's supposed to do in each of those situations and they're i guess still trying to iron out the the bugs in that yeah yeah, yeah. you know the irobot thing where the the child's dying and he's like save the child 
It goes. No, oh you yeah, Will Smith is in danger. Yeah. That's a terrible movie. Inch- uh, interesting. Uh, that uh, that book was written by Isaac, Isaac Asimov in 1950, about 17 right. years before Dreyfus wrote this article we've been reading. Any of you remember like Zizek's uh, Parable of the Map? It, this reminded me a bit of what Pills was talking about. Actually, it's kind of is this related, the Borgies? Parable of the map. Uh, <laughs> the Borge. The, okay, yes, I think uh, he might have drawn <laughs> what are from the Borges. Yeah. That comes back in the same episode. <laughs> uh, the idea is like he says, you know, think about a map. It's one of these extreme examples. What would be the best kind of map? And he says, uh, you know, there's this kingdom. They try to come up with one that's completely accurate, and then they realize that they just have to create a giant piece of paper that includes everything in the kingdom. And then they lay the piece of paper over the kingdom and the kingdom disappears because it's now as big as the literal mass they're trying to create. Uh, And the point of the story is, look, like you can't just sit there uh, and get anything useful from trying to give every bit of information possible. Uh, You need to kind of abstract away from the infinite complexity of the world to provide create a map that's useful for people who want to actually achieve something you know go from one city to another I meant baudrillard baby i don't know if zizek uses that too it's definitely baudrillard so you know this idea that we can if we simulate every neuron of a brain in a computer then like that that computer will somehow become start creating conscious states and i think um Cyril has like i think a very like good uh reaction to that right where he says um you know one can imagine a computer simulation of an of the action of peptides in the in the hypothalamus that is accurate down to the last synapse but equally one can imagine a computer simulation of the oxidation of the hydrocarbons in a car engine or the action of digestive processes in a stomach when it is digesting uh, pizza and the simulation is no more real a real thing than in the case of the brain than it is in the case of the car or the stomach Barring miracles, you could not run your car by doing a computer simulation of the oxidation of gasoline, and you could not digest pizza by running the program that simulates the stomach. Uh, <laughs> it seems obvious that a simulation of cognition will similarly not produce the effects of the neurobiology of cognition. I mean, that's um, a fun. It's a fun response. It's a fun example. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how I like his his idea of like rescuing the mind by appealing to semantics, saying. But none of it would have any meaning. I don't. I don't know if that even fits into those. Like, uh, well, you can't simulate those processes because they're physical processes happening somewhere else. And then if your simulation or your model of those processes would not be the thing itself. I mean, that's that point is well taken. It but is, that, but it, but it's, but it's not. Oh yeah, that part's well. Sorry, can finish. I mean, no, that's as far as I was going to get. I mean, the simulation is not the thing itself. It doesn't duplicate the process. It just simulates it, which can be useful for other purposes. Like if you're a gastronomy student and you want to study how the digestion system works, then right. yeah, look at that model. That would be great. Like, cause you can't watch yourself digesting something. So go for it. But well, I, I think mean, it's, 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 it's important and it's related to the syntax versus sem- semantics because I think his point is like these simulations are just syntactical processes but i think a lot of a lot of techno bros make this mistake where they think oh like because there's a there's a kind of bias towards thinking that consciousness is something immaterial it feels intuitive that oh if i could just simulate it then it's going to create the similar experience of something that doesn't have a substance and he's just like no no like it has a substance the brain is this has like a biophysical substance just like other biological processes have a uh, a kind of substance right and he says that it would be ridiculous to think that you could run a computer program that is again just a procedure rule following, um, and and I and I, f- I like I find it amusing. He says sort of like the strong thesis of AI is that any system whatsoever, whether whether it is made of beer cans, silicon chips, or toilet paper, not only might have thoughts and feelings, but must have thoughts and feelings, provided only that it implements the right program, right, with the impetus with the right inputs and outputs. Um, right. I think and I he get says you. That's, that's a profoundly anti-biological view. Is kind of his point, right? Yeah, so like it's a lot like, of these people. It's who, like who, saying who, the 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 simulation of digestion, a perfect simulation of the digestive system, is no more digestion than a perfect simulation of a brain would be, would be thinking. Consciousness, <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know that Elon Musk said it's very unlikely that we don't live in a simulation in like a. <laughs> in a higher the universe oh, yeah. is a simulation in a higher advanced species computer because it's almost impossible that they wouldn't have done that already. Ooh, that sounds like anyway, another episode. We don't know That's nothing about 
computers really how they work or brains for that matter but next week stay tuned because we will have a neuroscientist on here no a cognitive, cognitive scientist, scientist cognitive excuse scientist. me different 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 but I'm sure she she knows more <laughs> about brains than we do. Softer science. I, I, there were some things that we didn't get a chance to get to. Like uh, there's like some good objections that that Cyril addresses, like to the Chinese room, which I guess we won't talk about. But I th- I find them funny, right? A lot of people said that it's not the person that's conscious; it's the whole room that's conscious. The room, would be, the room that's is the conscious. System's response. The system's response. It's conscious, even though the the program itself isn't conscious, but the whole room becomes conscious because of a consequence of its of its following the program yeah that's not too far from like an extended mind kind of perspective that that sir yeah, i was gonna say i don't hate, mind that too much. i think drafe it no i mean i mean that's where a lot of these extended mind theses that like the you know when the when the uh when the person who's blind is using the walking stick they're they're not so much like grabbing a tool consciously and then like examining the responses that just no, their consciousness is just sort of extended through the stick and it's how they get through the world they're skilled with it so they don't think about it so it becomes almost part of them I, and Cyril would probably hate that but you know Ponte is a huge influence behind that way of thinking and he uses the blind man and the cane example all the time but go on. But that's di- but I think that's different than uh, than like you know some like emergent property from from following a syntactical procedure, right? Like I mean I think his other thought experiment to respond to that concern is like, you know imagine you had like a, a million chi- like Chinese people like organized in a way so that they're following a, a computer process that simulates <laughs> the brain. Then would would all of a sudden those million Chinese people become a conscious brain following that computer procedure? uh like yeah it's a, it's why do they have to be chinese just because the room's chinese yeah i think he just wanted continuity between chinese i, I had the- a question about chinese do do like all the chinese languages like mandarin and cantonese do that was the same script because why does he even say if i see chinese letters it's a good question i think that they mm, that do might have just the been, same script no i think it was also probably just a 1980s thing. <laughs> yeah, maybe. you probably didn't need to be as woke about that then as you do now. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I often feel like when you go order at a Chinese restaurant and there's no English translation on the menu, you are in a Chinese room experiment. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank God they usually have the numbers. Yeah, and then you don't know what you're gonna get, but they think you do, so they're like, "Yeah, a human is definitely ordering this food," and then they bring it to you, and you're like, "Oh shit, I ordered some pork." <laughs> All right, so we... I, I mean, I think this is invariably just a very difficult thing to hash out, right? There's a reason why philosophy of mind is all over the place. You know, there's people like David Chalmers that say consciousness is a separate, re- like, real thing uh, that can't be captured by materialist reductionism. Then you have people like Daniel Dennett who say that's completely out there, we can't have it. So there's no consensus on this, right? It's it, and I don't, not an intractable problem, but I think... As close to an intractable problem. Well, as you're ever it, it is, to but I, but I do find uh, like I think that I'm very convinced by both Searle and Dreyfus that like uh, that, that 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 digital computers cannot cause consciousness. And uh, I personally, I mean, maybe this the, our listeners, some of them will disagree, and they won't because we didn't maybe uh, do enough to make it clear for them. But to me, like the arguments are so decisive that it's like embarrassing that people still believe. Uh, that that we can create consciousness from digital computers because once I feel like you have that insight, it just becomes so obvious to me. I don't know if other people feel the same. But way. I think that there's a long history of that in European thought, right? I mean, what they're attacking with strong AI theses is again not really all that different from what you saw various forms of materialist Cartesianism wanting to achieve in the early 20th century, uh, which was to reduce the world down to a set of quantitative facts uh, that could be represented to the mind, right? It's this very convincing picture uh, that people who think of themselves as scientifically minded like. Uh, And I think what they're both just doing from different angles is saying, again, it's not going to happen because the mind is more complex than just that. It's not that we don't represent quantitative data to us in a certain way. In fact, we probably wouldn't get very far as a species if we weren't capable of doing that. Uh, but the mind, at least as far as we know, does a lot more. Um, and there are good reasons uh, to accept that kind of argument, because I agree with Victor. I don't know why it is that so many people struggle with this uh, beyond the cultural appeal of this image of a completely rational mind uh, that only sees things the way it is, the way it is uh, and doesn't make any non-impartial judgments. Well, one, of, one of the reasons for it is that it just feels 
phenomenologically, you could say, it just feels like your mind is pretty independent of the world. Like the world's out yeah, exactly. there, it's doing stuff, yeah, sure. it's not telling me what to do. So that thus, consciousness must be something disembodied or floating or soul-like or something like that. But what Merleau-Ponty would say, I mean, Dreyfus with Merleau-Ponty would say is that mm -hmm. the only reason that you have that feeling is because since you are a one and a half year old bumping into things, you've become so familiar with everything that it feels like you are over here and everything else is over there. But there, yeah. you don't need to have a separate order of representation to explain your feeling of consciousness. All you need is a lot of experience, which all of the yeah. adults at, at Oxford and MIT at Berkeley, all of us have this amount of experience that we can talk about it as something distinct. But the fact is that it's this very slow building process that takes years and years to acquire, uh, you know, coherency. Such a good point. I think like th that, that, that there's a kind of bias built into just the way we experience the world phenomenologically that makes it seem that way. And, you know, I think it is worth reemphasizing like to the, to the techno, if there are any, you know, te uh, like really techno optimists who, who like this idea that we can create consciousness that, you know, they think they're being really materialist in, yeah. in thinking that a computer can, be, can create consciousness. But it's like, you know, worth emphasizing the implication of, of, of Searle's argument in particular that really by believing that you are actually committing the same flaw that people who believe in an immaterial soul are committing, which is that consciousness That's all the way back is, to yeah, that you're, you're actually, you're, you're yeah. actually accepting the same assumption as if there's a, there's an immortal soul, because for you, uh, a computer program, which has no material biological, like, um, rootedness, you, you separate the two, you're actually committing a kind of dualism. Um, so I think like, you know, really the, it's, it's not the materialist position to actually take this, this techno utopianist view that we can create consciousness through uh, like b through kind of um, syntactical formal uh, rule following. I'm also going to venture a thesis by saying that I think part of the reason why people are attracted to this view is precisely that it has deep roots in European thought, other sorts that we've discussed before. I also think it's just because a lot of people who put forward these kind of arguments, and I'll use Merleau-Ponty's terms, uh, are intellectuals. Intellectualists. Things like... Sorry. Intellectual. Well, no, I know that's his term, intellectualist, but I'm actually meaning in this more colloquial term because it's very easy to, if you are an intellectual to assume that what exists are ideas, you know, symbol manipulation of a certain right. sort, right? And to give into that conceit, uh, it's not something that you would see somebody like the people Dreyfus talking about, uh, like a musician, right, uh, or what Heidegger's talking about, a barrel maker, fall into because they're very aware of the fact that they're embedded in this world of meanings uh, and that their body plays a role uh, in structuring their interpretation of the world in a way that I think a lot of intellectuals aren't, since frankly, we get a lot of our inputs about the world from books, symbols. Mm, right? Yeah. It, it. I mean, I think that's just a, I don't want to go too far no, but, with that because I think it's but, just a kind of crude anthropology on my part. But and if, it is you're not, I've noticed. if you're not an intellectual, uh, you know, get, where's my coffee? You know what I mean? <laughs> well, it's, it's also it's I think also it's just like the classic maybe pe uh, uh, motivation that people ascribe to religious people who believe in the immaterial soul, which is this fear of dying. Right. So like if our consciousness really is just a computer program, a syntactical program, then we could download our consciousness into a computer and live forever, as many of the techno utopianists believe. But if, in fact, it's actually the case that uh, our consciousness is uh, irreparably rooted in our bodies and in the flesh of our of, of, of our biological substance, then there's no getting around that. And uh, and you're just and there's no possibility that you're going to be able to live forever. Control the old the old thesis of control. I, I think when you get out of the weeds of this stuff and you look back on it, I mean, this is my takeaway is that neither of them say it's sort of not going to happen. I guess you could say that AI will develop so far that something like consciousness will be able to be made by human being. I don't think anyone are any of these guys are going to make predictions because that's stupid. Making predictions about technology is just opening up yourself to all kinds of grief. And nobody so you're predicting that nobody if you does make predictions that, about technology but is going to bring you to grief. I think the the main difference between these guys when you get out of the weeds, Dreyfus and Searle, and you look back and say, okay. Dreyfus says maybe it's possible, but I don't think so. I think it's in principle impossible that machines will ever be conscious. And Searle says I think it's in principle. I think it's possible. And I'm I'm not going to say whether or not it will happen, but it could happen. 
but not and that's but, the sort of you, you can't like that's a hair you just can't split between the two of them like yeah that's Searle true thinks it's in principle possible but not but not he has his examples and his syntactics and semantics and and then and then <laughs> dreyfus has his different perspective of you know you need a body and phenomenology and you have to be invested in the world and and you know and I, I love his examples of when these processes break down is when you really see them you know you have intentions you don't even realize i have all these cups sitting on my desk i reached out and grabbed one and took a drink out of it and got oh god that's not what i thought was in there and you see the the sort of intention process breakdown whereas that would never happen to a computer because as i said they do not make mistakes and making mistakes is how living things learn and the more mistakes we make the more we learn right and computers don't make mistakes so they don't learn in the sense that i'm using the word they learn maybe but again i don't know enough about deep learning algorithms to pronounce on that to be fair to to be fair to Searle though, like he would say that in principle, a, a a digital computer, in principle, could never be conscious. Well, I think so. Based like, on so our, like for, based on our Boolean logic or the way that code's written now, I, I think there could be a possibility. Well, I don't. I don't think that, that he thinks in. I, I think he thinks in principle, any any sort of uh, system that's based on syntactical symbol manipulation could never create consciousness. So he just says maybe we'll be able to make a physical machine based on some other physical material that can create consciousness maybe but he has no idea what that would be he's like anything that's based on syntax impossible like i think in the beginning he really lays it out and says you know can a machine think and he says that maybe it'll maybe it'll turn out to be impossible but there's nothing in principle stopping this from happening but maybe it will be impossible but, we do not know yet but, and i think yeah. he, he, dreyfus says we do not know yet but i think in principle that it is impossible that's what i'm saying i think is the, the main difference there the upshot and then everything else is getting into the weeds beyond that. Once you come out and take step back and take a look, I think their different methods bring them to that sort of last conclusion on whether it's possible or not. Well, I think I think I think Searle bases that just on the fact that human beings are biological machines that exist in the world. So therefore, in principle, there must be some method maybe to make something, but it just wouldn't be based on anything that we would know. Yeah. yeah, and I think that that's a, a very sound position to take, right? I mean, we do not have nearly enough information uh, about the nature of the brain uh, to talk about how, to use this terminology, produces the mind, yeah. right? That He says, you know, the mind is what the brain does. So the brain is ultimately just a collection of physical materials, and it can produce a mind. Obviously, it's possible in principle for physical materials to produce a mind, but that's not what digital hardware does right yeah, now. Yeah, and that's not even... Right? And he's kind of tries to set that question aside to just be like, well... Yeah. It's not really what we're talking about. And and he's just saying that to be like, I'm not trying to make room for a soul here. I'm just telling you that like, uh, like, like digital computers is not sufficient in principle for anything that's conscious. And I think Pills, I think it was Pills who said that, put it really well. He's kind of like, look, since we do know in, that in principle, it's possible for physical material to produce a mind, maybe we could build an actual mind at some point, but that would mean fundamentally changing the background assumptions that we have about what it is that the mind does. I'll just side with Spinoza that the mind is the image of the body, but we've been going for a while and I think some of it's Friday, not for us, it's Friday for them. So maybe they want to go get unconscious while they still have the chance. I, I, di I did just want to, I did. I did just want to like say quickly like what we read in case the listeners want to go and find it. We read from Scientific America, John Searles, Is the Brain's Mind a Computer Program? And then we read the 1967 piece from Herbert Dreyfus in Review of Metaphysics, Why Computers Must Have Bodies in Order to Be Intelligent. Which he rewrote as what computers can't do, I think, three, five years later, a few years later. Yeah, I think so. Anyway, think something so. like that. Anyway, guys, uh, good talk. Hello. Thanks. Maybe we all live in a simulation. Techno uh, optimist, get at me on Twitter. I'll, I'll fight you. Yeah, go fight, Victor. I don't want to argue with you. So, <laughs> all right, peace. Peace. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs>